Would you join me in prayer? Come, Holy Spirit. Help us to truly make Jesus Christ our cornerstone, the foundation of our life. And help us now as we study his word to hear what he said so long ago and what he says to us today. Help me to speak the truth faithfully. and Help us to hear. Help us to respond as you call us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Some years back, probably 10 or 15 or maybe 20, because you know time seems to go pretty fast, and I lose track, but there were uh, some books that came out called Chicken Soup for the Soul. Any of you remember those books? Now, that they were um, uplifting books because what they were were uh, saw, uh, stories that people wrote in and, and shared, and the editors would put them together, and so they were all positive, uplifting, inspiring stories that were collected in a book, and then you could read them and, and feel good every day. And so um, I wanted to share with you a story from one of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books this morning. And the author of this particular story is Donna Wick, and she is the founda founder of the Center for Positive Change in Houston. And this is the story that Donna wrote, and I wanted to share with you today. So these are Donna's words. The day was Thankful Thursday. Thursday has become our day to go out into the world and make a positive contribution. On this particular Thursday, my little girls and I had no idea what we were going to do, but we knew something would present itself. Driving along a busy Houston road around noon, praying for guidance in our quest to fulfill our weekly act of kindness. My two little girls began chanting, McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's! <laughs> and I relented and began searching for the nearest McDonald's. Suddenly I realized that Almost every intersection I passed was occupied by a panhandler. And then it hit me. If my two little girls were hungry, then these panhandlers must be hungry too. Perfect. Our act of kindness had presented itself. We would buy lunch for the panhandlers. So after finding McDonald's and ordering two Happy Meals for my girls, I ordered an additional 15 lunches. And we set out to deliver them. It was exhilarating. We would pull alongside a panhandler, make a contribution, and tell him or her that we hope things got better. Then we'd say, oh, by the way, here's lunch. And then we would speed off to the next intersection. It was the best way to give because we did not have time to introduce ourselves or explain what we were doing. And there was no time for them to say anything back to us. At our last stop, there was a woman standing there asking for change. We handed her our final contribution and lunch bag and immediately made a U-turn to head back in the opposite direction toward home. However, the light caught us again and we were stopped at the same intersection where this woman stood. I was embarrassed and did not know quite how to behave. I did not want her to feel obligated to say or do anything. But she made her way to our car, and so I put the window down just as she started to speak. No one has ever done anything like this for me before, she said in amazement. And I replied, well, I'm glad that we were the first. Feeling uneasy and wanting to move the conversation along, I asked, so when do you think you'll eat your lunch? She just looked at me with those huge brown eyes and said, oh, honey. I'm not going to eat this lunch. You see, I have a little girl of my own at home, and she just loves McDonald's, but I can never buy it for her because I just don't have the money. But you know what? Tonight, she is going to have McDonald's. Donna Wick ends her story with these words. So many times I question whether our acts of kindness were too small or insignificant to really affect change. Yet in that moment, I recognized the truth of Mother Teresa's words. We cannot do great things, only small things, with great love. 
Like many of us, Donna Wick wanted to do something to help others, but she did not really want to get involved with them. It was much easier to give away her lunches when she could just drive away. But when Donna had to look into the eyes of one she had helped and hear something of that person's story, the woman she had helped was no longer just some beggar alongside the road. She was a real person, a mother who loved her daughter. Jesus was born so that he could share in our human life. He did not just send salvation down from heaven. The Son of God became one of us in order to bring salvation to us himself. Jesus came into our world to share our pain and our struggle. He came to get involved. And I believe that Jesus calls us to do the same, to get involved in the mission that he began. In our scripture passage for today, once again, Jesus calls us to turn away from the ways of the world and to join him by getting involved with those in need. Our scripture passage for today is found in Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 24. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible or in a pew Bible, or the words will be on the, on the screen. For those of you who are guests with us today, we are studying the Gospel of Luke. and We started at the very beginning, and now we're at chapter 14. We're going slowly and taking in everything that Jesus said and did along the way. So today in Luke 14, verses 1 through 24, and this is a long passage, but it all goes together as one story, and so we're going to read all of it. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, Is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. Then he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on a Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, Give this person your place. And then, in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, in case they may invite you in return, and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. One of the dinner guests, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town, and bring in the poor, 
the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as we continue our study of the life and ministry according to the Gospel of Luke, we know that in chapter 14, Jesus is on his way toward Jerusalem, where he knows that he will be crucified. And on one Sabbath day along the way, Jesus evidently stopped to worship at a synagogue where he met a leader of the Pharisees of that town. And this Pharisee invited Jesus and others to come to his home for a meal. Well, on their way to the Pharisees' home, Jesus saw a man with dropsy. Now, dropsy refers to swelling in the body because uh, the body is retaining excess fluid. And so the man may have had congestive heart failure or kidney disease. Whatever, Jesus recognized that this man was very ill and in need of healing. And we know from previous scripture passages that we've read in Luke that Pharisees were against healing on the Sabbath because it was a violation of the religious rule to rest on the Sabbath. So Jesus asked these Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? Well, they did not answer. But Jesus got involved anyway. He healed the man. Now, these Pharisees had been taught that resting on the Sabbath was one of the most important things that a faithful Jew must do. So we should not be too quick to judge them for their faithfulness, what they believed was God's will. However, Jesus came to show them and us that sometimes the best way to worship God is by getting involved in Jesus' mission to bring good news by helping those in need. Jesus was not against keeping the Sabbath. He joined God's people in worship in the synagogue. He rested and feasted and fellowshiped with God's people according to their religious practices. But when Jesus had to choose between keeping a religious rule and meeting human need, Jesus chose to meet human need because he knew that human need is more important to God than keeping religious rules. Now, evidently, after healing the man with dropsy, Jesus and the Pharisees continued on to their dinner. And while the Pharisees were watching Jesus closely, Jesus was also watching them. And they were doing exactly what people in their culture often did at this kind of a gathering. Each one was trying to get the best seat at the table. You see, what, where a person sat at the table at these dinners was a sign of how important that person was. Social status and position or honor in society were very important to people. Perhaps in a similar way that many of us today are very concerned with what people think of us. For us, being popular, approved, accepted, respected by certain people, that's of great value to us. And so we can probably relate to the importance of social status to these Pharisees. But Jesus told them a parable in order to teach them and us what is important in God's kingdom is not what other people think, getting to sit at the place of honor or climbing the social ladder. No, what is important in God's kingdom is humility or considering others better than ourselves. Furthermore, in God's kingdom, the host does not invite those who are his social equals or those he's trying to impress so that he can improve his social status. Instead, the host who lives in God's kingdom will get involved with those in need by inviting the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Jesus came to bring good news to the poor, to the people that society rejects. Jesus came to heal them, to bring them hope, to show them that they are important to God, and to invite them 
to join in God's kingdom. Those who follow Jesus will get involved with the people who the world rejects, but who Jesus loves. When Jesus said that those who get involved with the poor will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, the Pharisees assumed that Jesus was talking about them because the Pharisees were the very best at keeping the religious rules, which in their mind was what being righteous means. So one of the Pharisees says, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God, assuming that he was going to be one of those. Then Jesus told another parable about a great dinner that Sally shared with us with the children. And Jesus told this parable to illustrate what being righteous really means and who will really eat bread in the kingdom of God. The parable of the great dinner tells the story of a wealthy, powerful man, someone that the Pharisees would respect and look up to. And in the parable, the man does what is standard practice in his culture. He invites his wealthy friends who share his social standing to a great dinner. But when the dinner is ready, all of his friends make excuses not to come. Now in this culture, the friend's rejection would bring shame upon the host. And according to the scripture, the man got angry, but his response was not to retaliate against those who said they couldn't come, as would be the cultural norm, but to do what G he did, what Jesus said to do. He invites the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And when there's still room for more, he sends his slave out into the roads and lanes to compel everyone to come to the great dinner. So, what does this parable mean? Well, it could mean, as Sally said, that God invited his people, the Jews, which would include the Pharisees in this passage, to his great dinner at the end of the age. And God sent his son to invite them and tell them it's time. But many of them refused to come to the great dinner when they rejected God's son, Jesus, and his teaching. So now God invites everyone to his great dinner. And all who will respond to his invitation through faith in Jesus and obedience to Jesus' words will feast with the Lord at the great dinner at the end of the age. And that's good news for us. Because you and I are invited to the great dinner at the end of the age. As Sally brought out, the question is whether or not we will respond to the invitation and come through faith in Jesus. But in this parable, there is also a challenge for those of us who have responded to God's invitation to enter the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus, his son, and therefore expect to be included in the great dinner? The challenge is this. If we truly are living in God's kingdom, then we will take the role of the slave in the parable and go out and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. We will deliver our master's invitation to everyone, and especially to those who are not usually included, so that they might come into the kingdom of God and to the great dinner. So what is Jesus saying to us through this scripture passage? How is Jesus calling you and me to change our understanding of what it means to worship God by getting involved with those in need? How is God calling us, as his people, to go out into our community to invite the ones that we would not usually invite to come into the kingdom of God? Now, I confess to you that I do not know how to do this. I don't even know where we should begin, but I am convinced I am convicted that we must begin to pray 
and to act as God leads us in this area. God is calling us to proclaim the good news of Jesus' coming with our words and to demonstrate the good news of Jesus' coming through our deeds. And if we are willing, God will show us how to get involved in Jesus' mission to bring good news to the poor. So let's take a few moments to reflect on God's word for us today. If you would like to come to the altar rail, you're certainly welcome to do that during this time. Let's just take a few moments to ask God to speak to us at this time. As we continue in prayer, would you take your insert from your bulletin it's on this pretty lavender colored paper? As we pray together our prayer for this week. Gracious and loving God, we confess that we often fail to get involved with the poor. We would like to help them live a better life but we honestly do not know where to begin. However, we read in the Bible that you have always called your people to help the poor. And we read in the Gospels that Jesus came to bring good news to the poor, and he calls his disciples to continue this mission. And so we ask for your guidance in this area. Help us to see those around us who need to hear the good news of Jesus' love for them. Then give us the words to say and the courage to say them. Show us the ones who need to experience the good news through our generosity or our service. Then use us to provide for their needs in such a way that honors you and truly helps them. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Help us to dare greatly to live as Jesus' disciples and to help others become his disciples too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.